Welcome to the last lecture in the part of our class Symmetry, Structure, and Tensor Properties of Materials dealing with crystallography. In this last lecture here, we wanted to go over some 2D maps of some of the 230 three-dimensional space groups in order to just get you familiar with that and apply some of the principles and uh, notation and symbols that we've been talking about. Um, after this lecture, what we'll be doing is then giving you some rules about, in case you haven't seen it before, about how to populate these lattices. Remember, the beauty of this class is that we have been able to create the possible crystal structures purely from geometrical considerations. And then, now is the time to add real materials, real atoms, and we'll show you the principles involved with that. And after that, then we'll uh, go into how to represent uh, materials properties based on uh, tensors, which can be mapped on to different crystal structures. Uh, in this lecture, I'm just showing you um, there are many different versions of how to represent these. I found an excellent uh, website shown here, uh, which actually has um, all the... Um, uh, space groups online and if you click on them uh, you can pull up the various two-dimensional repre representations of these three-dimensional point groups. So we'll go through a few of the simple ones in order to show you the notation so then uh, we've, we've already talked about in the last lectures to um, all the notations so we'll just show you some of them applied to, to these particular cases. So here I'm showing you um, the uh, P1, this is just to give you an outline of the way that this particular database uh, uses the notation. So here is the shorthand version of the international to notation. And what you'll notice in the middle here is a notation used by this particular uh, international sort of computer uh, standard representation. Uh, what you'll see in the other ones is there'll be more digits here. Even if they're one, they'll still be represented, where later on we drop them. But here they'll continue to be represented. Here is the basis. We haven't talked much about basis, but it's essentially the motif that we're going to hang off of each lattice site. So, for example, um, you know, this is the motif that's to the uh, right of this dot, if you will. You can think of this as being some number of units. Well, I guess the better one to look at is over here. This is some number of units up into the crystal structure arbitrarily set at x, y, z. Okay? And its relationship, its basis relationship to this point here. And so that's it. Nothing else to say because, of course, it's the most simple one. Uh, just that the Axes are represented here by A prime and B prime, and you'll see that shifts later because this particular convention using this source will be to change uh, this axis into C when we have particular uh, symmetries that become available, and that the B direction, which will be shooting out of the paper at that point, uh, will be. Uh, the one in which they represent the uh, the higher symmetries because we'll show axes coming out of this direction. So for now, that's pretty much it. Gamma prime is the angle between A prime and B prime. Remember, the convention is that gamma is the between A and B, and between uh, uh, B and C is alpha, uh, and between A and C is beta. So now we can take the triclinic. I forgot to mention that, the, of course, the primitive system is triclinic, and this is still triclinic. It's the only other option for triclinic. Now you can see what's happened here is we've added the little tiny circles. Uh, of course, the first tiny circle we add um, is to the center point because um, we will have an inversion in the center of the <coughs> lattice. Um, there's an inversion point added at the lattice point here, and that causes an inversion down below. And this is kind of um, 
The interesting thing, uh, we had used just dots and circles to show when something moves to the other side. Here, the convention is being used as that plus. Let's imagine that this is some distance up to the right, x, y, z. Down below, if we if we were referring to this as zero zero zero, for example, uh, through that inversion center, this guy becomes minus x minus y minus z, as you can see here. So this gives you the coordinates for the two atom basis that's hung on every lattice point. The other thing they do is they put this little comma in here, which represents the fact that this we can think of as a right-handed, where the comma we can think of as left-handed. So that's kind of with just a dot in a circle, you have a hard time understanding what's <clears throat> right-handed or left-handed, and that fixes that problem. Now, of course, if I put inversion center here to invert this, and I put inversion center to invert this, you see that, of course, I need one in the center to go in and invert that. Uh, pretty soon, though, as you fill out the rest of the motif, of course, this couplet needs to be produced up here, and you start to realize, well, there's a uh, inversion point there. And of course, there has to be an inversion. Oops, sorry, a inversion point there, going through this middle point here, and of course, the same thing uh, in the other case. And that's why you end up with inversions everywhere. Okay, so again, the atom basis shown over to the right. So now we get a little more complicated. Now you can see the change in notation I talked about. So we call this P2, where we took the primitive lattice and just added twofold axis. And this is going to be 3D. So this is just adding twofold axes to the monoclinic. Remember, this is a monoclinic lattice now. So we shifted from triclinic to monoclinic. Sorry, you can't read that probably. So I'll write that over here monoclinic. And that's because twofold axis has to be, um, you know, um, twofold axis can only be compatible with the monoclinic. And uh, you can see the change that I was talking about for now, the way that this particular international notation has been set, it creates C direction here, the A direction over here, and now it uses the B to be the, the one that we're seeing. So you can tell that because here's the twofold axes that we've put in the lattice points, as we know we had theorems which show that we have to place the twofold axes then here, here, and here, because of our theorem that in between two twofold axes have another one, and so on. Of course, because I shifted lattice, and I'm thinking of this guy coming straight out, this becomes beta because the angle between C and A. Uh, in terms of the uh, basis, though, it's this—it's just the rotation around the twofold axis, right? Because we have x, y, z, which is our original position here. And again, if I'm thinking of this as 0, 0, 0, then uh, all that happens is I rotate 180 degrees around there, and that's it. And you can see that, you know, like we've done many times, of course, these other twofold axes, which we have in here from, in our case, from uh, our combination theorems, you can tell by inspection that they have to be here because, of course, this guy is related to this guy. This guy's related to that guy through there. This guy's uh, related to this guy through there, etc. So the world is good. Uh, this is what you'll find with computers that generate patterns a lot because, of course, we eliminate the the ones and just refer to it P2 in the shorthand notation, but in the complete notation, it's P121. Getting a little more complex now, we'll look at the centered lattice. You recall that the centered lattice meant that now we take uh, a lattice point and we put it in the middle. So this two, two-fold axis is not induced from the P2, or in other words, a two-fold axis added to the, to the uh, centered lattice. The centered lattice starts with this and that point and that point and that point and that point. And so we induce this and this and this and this through the uh, through the um, uh, theorems we already know. Uh, now let's look at what happens uh, when we have this, you know, centered lattice. Here's our original motif, and we just spin it around, and so this one and this one are just related again through 180 degree rotation, right? Same thing at each lattice point, right? However. Remember that to get the centered lattice here, uh, 
this means that um, we now have to think about um, the translation vector that would produce uh, the point uh, which would move T3 from here. Let me just draw this. T3, instead of going straight up, let's have T3 come in this direction. So that means that if I'm going to go up and sit above this, I have two translations to get there, which would bring me here, and then I bring myself back, and that's a side-centered lattice. Now, in that transition as I'm going, I'm going to go halfway up the cell to get out here. So this guy goes halfway up, so the plus one-half is on top of this original position. And of course, the same thing occurs here, and it has to have a 180 degree uh, rotation about there. So we have this uh, sort of motif that's now halfway up, partially down here, and then, and of course, when I come all the way down here, I'd be at some full T3 above, or of course, down at the zero, I'd be uh, down here. Now that of course tells me that I have a rotation, uh, sorry, a, um, a 2, 1 axis here because here I have uh, these motifs and then uh, if I go up half the unit cell, right, I rotate 180 degrees and I have these guys. So I actually have an array of 2, 1 axis and this is where you see that, remember this is the B plane. So all the actions occurring here. So this is one of those cases where I have a 2, 1, and a 2, but I've got nothing below. But the 2 dominates. So even though I have both a 2-fold axis and a 2, 1 axis, I ignore that and just talk about these because that will be derived from knowing that I have a 2-fold axis coming out. And of course, I don't have anything coming in the C direction or the A direction. Right, all the a all the action is coming out of this plane here in the B. So in the complete notation they're using in this sort of computer generated thing is C121, but in the shorthand notation we just call it C2. Oh, and I forgot to mention. So now we have an additional basis atom that is from here, which is uh, because we're coming up halfway over this twofold axis. Right, that's a uh, uh, you know, from the notation point of view, remember that that's one half, one half, uh, zero to get up there. In a way, kind of complicating it, but in a way, at least not a centered lattice, uh, we can actually, and now with our knowledge of screw axes, remember how like in the 2D system, once we knew we had a glide system, we went back and took the lattices compatible with it and inserted a glide system. And, you know, that's what we're doing here. So here's our primitive monoclinic. Our primitive monoclinic lattice. And what we've done is said, all right, I'm going to put uh, actually a 2-1 axis in each one of these places. So here we have our motif in some XYZ known as 1 here. So, you know, way to think about that's number 1. And this is number two, where um, it's uh, X bar, and then that's a little confusing when you look at the computer-generated thing here. So X bar uh, says that, of course, the X, right, which is the A, you know, uh, switches direction, and the Z, which is the C, switches direction, but the one coming out of the page uh, is going up by a half, and that's what you see here. So this is kind of... You know, if this were somewhere, this is coming up, halfway up the unit cell. And then, of course, when I come up to a full translation above this point, coming straight up, this... And uh, that is just about it, as far as I can tell. So, again, computer database is 1211, but in shorthand notation, we just have P21. So getting a little more interesting now and a lot more complex just by doing a few uh, interesting things. Let's actually go to magenta. So let's start 
with what we've done. So we have said, okay, uh, we are going to put a two-fold axis. So this is just like the last one that we had where we have uh, two-fold, two-one screw axis on each one. So we're starting off with P21. But then in this plane, the B plane, we're putting a mirror plane, right? It's perpendicular. That's what this says. So it's perpendicular to it. So perpendicular to the two one axis coming out is this mirror plane. Now, of course, we know from our theorem before, our combination theorem, that this little white circle opens up because that's an inversion. So when you have the plane like this to two-fold axis, you get uh, an inversion in the center. Now, if you go back and look at that last pattern that we had, we had this sort of plus here and then a, a minus half um, over here uh, before with the screw axis, sorry, without the, uh, without that. And now what happens, let's just go back and show you that just in case you forgot. So see here, right, we have this um, screw axis where we have, we're at some point, again, if we call this zero, 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 we're at one point here where we're um, at some X, Y, Z. And then we came up half addition to that where we added in the Y direction, which is coming out of this plane half and we're just opposite over here and so that makes this the uh, screw axis but now if i put a um, a mirror plane in here what's going to happen is this guy gets reflected down and to show that first of all we have to show down below that it's sharing a spot with something down below this plane that's the opposite handedness and then uh, we also have to show uh, that I've translated down by the same amount, right? And then on this one, uh, the same effect that I have to then take this and show that it's been reflected down by the same amount down below minus, right? So you'll see that in the next one. So that's how we got um, from uh, the uh, now we have an inversion axis here so I pass through this one has to pass through here and reach the other side and this one has to pass through reach the other side so basically um, I have four uh, motifs around here one up one up one down one down and and inverted from each other and that's what's at each corner and it also produces those guys here and you can see that in the basis um, over here as well the other thing that's um, added now that's why we're going through these is that notice how uh, you can see uh, the notation for the glide right so we actually have the glide of one quarter uh, shown here which is one quarter of the of the lattice Again, remember this notation shows you the in-plane glide, so that there's an in-plane in, in, in -plane glide uh, right in that direction. And so there you have it. So we have um, given you some examples of the, uh, of the 2D representations of these three-dimensional space groups. Obviously, you can get more complicated, but in the next lectures now, we'll move on and we'll populate some of these with some rules or at least show you some general rules on how to pack real atoms into these symmetries now that we have them. And then we'll very quickly move on and talk about how to represent materials properties with, um, with notations, tensors, that allow us to represent the symmetries of crystals.